Welcome to the show proper. I've been joined by Ricky Ware. He's the founder, Jesse to Africa for football. Ricky, it's nice to have you on the program sports desk. Great to be here. Thanks for inviting me. And um, Ricky, I'm sure you've been following the 2022 FIFA World Cup tournament in Qatar. Yeah, abs absolutely. Um, I follow World Cups, uh, I think, religiously since 1974. So Religiously since 1974. Yeah. So it's, a, it's always a great massive. event. Yeah. And um, what do you make of the FIFA World Cup competition since you've been following since 1974? This particular one? Um, once we get over all the initial controversy then and it's settled down to the football, it's been yeah, it's been exceptional in terms of not necessarily the quality of the football, but the drama. The drama. And the upsets. Um, Interesting. Normally you get maybe one big upset mm. in a tournament, you know, going back to uh, you know, Cameroon beating Argentina back in nineteen ninety and Italian uh, 90. I think Senegal had a, you know, was so, it France beat a big yeah, upset 2002. in 2002. But, uh, you know, this time around, we've had it's been many it's upsets. just coming in. And, you know, uh, ever, ever since the Saudi Arabia, you know, upset of Argentina, Argentina. That, that just woke everybody up. Um, uh, does, does this show that the perceived smaller nations are catching up with the so-called big countries in football. For example, the Brazilians are five-time champions, the most successful side. But it is also surprising to know that since 2002, Brazil is yet to lift the trophy aloft. No, uh, the, the gap is definitely closing. There's no doubt about it. Um, the coaching is getting better. Um, and, and some of the bigger teams have maybe got too used to playing not to lose. And a lot of the smaller teams have nothing to lose. And you can see that in some of the dynamics of the way they're playing. You know, really, not some t some of the bigger teams go into this early games trying to hold something back, keep something in reserve. These smaller teams have just been going out and just Running giving out. it all, giving their all. Uh, mass and that's that's for as a, as a pure football fan without any affiliation to any one country. That's great to see. <laughs> that's great to see. Great to see good football, no doubt. And. Um, Taking a look at the quarterfinal results on your screen, Croatia, Brazil. It's ended one all after extra time. And um, the Brazilians were kicked out by Croatia on um, penalties. Uh, your range of the Netherlands against La Baselist of Argentina also two all. And then um, definitely La Baselist of Argentina won four goals to three on penalties. The Atlas Lions of Morocco representing the continent of Africa, 1-0 against Portugal. And indeed, Cristiano Ronaldo was in tears. Like they say, after the final whistle, the tears start rolling down. The tacticians go back to the drawing board. But at this point in time, it's um, a win-win situation for the Atlas Lions of Morocco. The defending champions, Le Bleu of France, still hoping that they can defend their trophy successfully. They beat the three Lions of England, Two goals to one. Let's bring you highlights. When we come back, we shall be taking a look at the semi-final appearance. Who will scale through to the final of the FIFA World Cup Qatar 2022? TVC Sport Desk. Welcome back. Well, let's take a look at them, the second semi-final appearance at the sport in time. Morocco up against the defending champions, France. On paper, you can't really look beyond France, but football's not played on paper, it's played on grass. And I've said, I said to one of my sons after the Belgium game, when Morocco basically knocked Belgium out, that they have, I just sensed, and I said to him, think about Greece in 2004. Hmm. And they've beat some... Chris they, managed by Otto Rea Yeah, they've gone on to... And every round, people just thought, oh. that's it. You know, they've had one shot, you know. But they've gone on to beat Spain and... Um, Belgium, Port, the second you know, highest Port, Spain and Portugal. Team. Two Portugal. highly, highly ranked sides. It's not like they've been kind of beating like sides. Um, obviously, the weight. biggest ask is, is going to be France, but it's <laughs> not impossible. It's not impossible. Yeah. If, uh, if they recover their energy levels... They need to practice some shooting for sure mm. because every part of their game was almost spot on, but you almost uh, felt that their 
they, they arrived in the goal mouth and, and some of those players looked like they didn't know what they were meant to do. And that's no disrespect to Morocco because they had got everything so right. They are not going to be an easy proposition for France. And once again, my head would love to see them do it. But if there's just an edge with someone like Mbappé and his team, but they are a team capable of shutting down his space. There's mm. no doubt because I don't think you can play one man on Mbappé and they that's wouldn't true. do that. They will, they will build a matrix that just, you know, like a, an insect or a spider caught in the web or something. Mm. That's, that's, that's what Morocco do. And they will frustrate and they'll, they'll play, they'll leave every piece they have on the field. It, it, it could be the biggest game for them so far, as far as in the tournament is concerned. Like you said about Argentina, they get better with each game. France, to a large extent, also um, have been getting better with each game. But then, uh, do you agree with Austin J.J. Okocha, um, who says um, it's a battle between um, African um, players? Um, and um, if you take a look at the French team, almost half of the side, you know, um, are Africans. And uh, they could have been playing for an African country um, if they had decided. Axel Dizazi, um, he could have played for Congo. You have um, Juice Kunde for Benin Republic, a uh, defender with Barcelona. You also have Matteo Guendouzi, former Arsenal player now doing business at the State Velodrome with Olympic Marseille. He's a Moroccan. You also have Aurelian Tuchemeni for Cameroon. Um, Usman Dembele is a Malian. You have Randal Kolomuni. Moani is from Congo. Yusuf Fofana um, is from Mali. Steve Mandanda, a goalkeeper, is from DR Congo. William Saliba, you know, a Cameroonian, no doubt. And then JJ says this is a battle of in Africans. Yeah, there's no doubt about it. I mean, they, they play under the flag of France. Their roots are in Africa. It's it's a great compliment to Africa and to African players. Um, but can you perhaps reverse the trend that in 20 years from now, those levels of African players will be playing for African countries? Um, because if that manages to change or evolve, then, you know, it, it's no longer going to be a an unusual feature for an African team to be getting this far because clearly the players are there but history, involvement, players going to Europe, players migrating out of the country uh, at a young age and adopting their or playing for their adopted country uh, is obviously part of how the world has developed and football is very much part of that but you would like you know a lot of the stuff I'm doing on the grassroots is really encouraging Africa to invest in itself uh, particularly in football and encourage young players to stay in Africa as opposed to be searching, you know, far and wide for what they think is a golden ticket. Well, before we take a look at them other happenings quickly, um, let's take a look at um, the possibility of an African country winning the FIFA World Cup tournament. It has never happened. Mm -hmm. um, could it be 2022? Could it be 2022? Well, it, it's, the closest, it's the closest they've came so far. Why not? Why not? Two games away to... in football, um, and certainly this is the one. If they if they got past France, it's a they are whoever guessed. they're playing in the final. It's a fifty-fifty game. It's a fifty-fifty game say. for them. You know, like they say, the higher you go in life, the cooler it becomes. Well, but then at this point in time, the higher you go, the tougher it becomes uh, in um, football. Let's um, leave the FIFA World Cup tournament um, for a while, and um, uh, let me indeed them um, come to you at this point, Ricky. Um, let's talk about some um, football development in Nigeria. You've been involved in your project, you know, um, for years. Um, what has it been like for you in the past 10 years, talking about founder, as the founder Jersey to Africa for football? What does this mean to you? Um, it's, it's a project that's really just evolved, it unfolded. I didn't set out with a plan to be here 10 years later. Um, but I found, particularly in Kenya, which is where I started and I've done, we've done most of our, our work, uh, I just found a draw, a draw and a desire for knowledge uh, within Kenya, no different within Nigeria. And I found that I had a value to offer and I was uh, willing to do so. Um, and through my football background and connections, feel that my life and football for me had a purpose, a re-energized purpose. Uh, having spent the first 50 years of my life predominantly in Europe as a, as a player, a coach, a manager and, and as a president of my FA, uh, I felt 
having gone through that whole spectrum, um, I had a lot of knowledge, uh, experience and contacts, and I found the African coaches, players, everybody had a desire to hear uh, and receive what I had to offer, and that was very encouraging. Uh, what I see has been very inspiring, um, and it's you can only make a small difference, but um, over the years we've built a strong credibility, and I'm always looking to encourage uh, investment into Africa, and that's a trend I'm really, really passionate about reversing, because for every... Ten conversations I have, nine of them are almost saying, okay, what, how can you get some of our players to Europe? The, the whole, and mm. I just cut the conversation immediately. I'm not interested. I could be a, easily could be an agent, even mm. a bona fide one, mm. but it's a false dream. Mm. And uh, I'm looking to encourage at all levels uh, people that are willing to make investment into Africa for football development and building from your base and not trying to suck the talent out to somewhere else. You are a Scottish Nigerian. How many years have you spent in Nigeria? And how well do you know the country of Nigeria? I have to say I don't know Nigeria that well. Um, my background, yes, I'm Scottish Nigerian, but uh, I was uh, an illegitimate child. Uh, it took me 40 until, yeah, until I was almost 40 to then go on the journey to trace my Nigerian roots. Um, this is my fourth trip to yeah. Nigeria, but no, I can't say I've lived here, experienced. I read a lot. I have engaged with my family, so I've learned a lot of you know Nigerian culture and habits. And I've, I've also spent a long, plenty of time in Kenya, and whilst Kenya clearly is not Nigeria, um, I'm, I'm, I, I'm colorless, you know, not colorless, but you know, for me, I don't differentiate. You know, Nigeria is one, it's Africa. And there's, in football, there's many, many commonalities, and that's the only part I'm interested in. How huge is the, is the business side of football that so many African countries have not been able to tap into it? The business side is, is massive. And there's no reason that Africa in general, and Nigeria in particular, shouldn't be tapping into it. But you have to... You have to get the base right. You have to get the right people in the right places for the right reasons, doing the right things with the money that's available. Um, that's, that's the issue. There is absolutely money around to be invested in Nigerian football. Hmm. But my sense is those people aren't willing to throw that money down a black hole hmm. um, because of the administration within football. And that's what has to change. That has to change massively. Well, let's um, indeed hope that um, some days we will indeed um, get it right. And um, to get it right in football in Nigeria, in sports in Nigeria, it starts from the developmental program. Um, Ricky, let me come back to you. And at this stage, when you take a look at them, um, being the ambassador for working for Football Federation for Africa, how well um, is the sports growing on the continent? Working football. Um, very early stages. Uh, it's the opposite end of the spectrum to most of the work I do, which is with the youth. Um, but it's a developing sport for retired footballers. Um, it's a growing sport and there's going to be a World Cup in 2023 in England. And there I've uh, introduced it both to Rwanda and to Nigeria, both of whom will take a representative side to uh, participate in the World Cup in 2023 at St George's Park, the home of the FA in England. So that, I hope, will be a catalyst to really spiking and growing the attention for the sport because I think it's, uh, it, adds, uh, it can add 20 years to your uh, way. There's a perception that it's something that just for old men, um, but if you actually get in and try, it's actually a, a very dynamic sport, uh, but it reduces the amount of injuries uh, because of various rules that you have to play to. So it's, uh, I've got no doubt it's going to be a growing sport over the next 10 years.
and okay. the enthusiasm in Africa that the nations I've spoken to has been exceptional. Victor. Well, I must say very brief. Thank you, Ware, for being a part of the program. Absolutely. Um, it's pleasure. nice to have you on the program, Ricky Ware. And then that's where the quickest crumble on today's edition of the show, talking about sports desk. Tomorrow will be another time in the ever exciting world of sports. Me and I, on behalf of the crew, dropping anchor.